physiology. We are going to talk today uh, two main topics. Welcome again to Anatomy Physiology. We are going to talk about uh, today is lecture number three and welcome everyone. We will talk about the skeletal system chapter eight. Okay, so we will start talking about the bones from the very beginning and uh, I hope this is going to be uh, helpful uh, for this is kind of part of review and um, part is going to be new. Okay, all right, so as we said, so here we have the skeletal system. The skeletal system is going to be composed basically by bone and cartilage. Okay, bone and cartilage. So cartilage is going to be is going to be a, actually always together with this cartilage. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. Now, uh, all right. So let's start with the very beginning. Number one. Uh, the person starts to form bones since week number nine of gestation. A week nine, your baby starts to form those bones. At the beginning, these bones are not going to be like solid, solid, like, uh, like you are in adult. These bones are going to be formed based on cartilage. Cartilage. So basically, all, all, all the, the newborn, the, the fetus, or the embryo at that time, fetus already, that is going to be forming the bones based on cartilage. So what is the difference? How they are going to change that? So cartilage basically is the base of the bone. That After that, they are going to bring some cells that we will talk today, and it's going. they are going to bring some calcium. They are going to deposit calcium in the cartilage that is going to turn into bone, okay? All right. But bone, I want to ask you, why bone is white? We already know that bo bone is white, are wh is white because they have a high content of calcium. Am I saying that? Because uh, I want you to know that calcium is not, is actually, is not only needed to form bones, okay? Calcium is needed for many other activities. Calcium is for many other activities. And that's what I want you to always think about. The calcium is, but we are going to talk about the bones and then the physiology at the end, okay? So we have 206 bones, okay? And the functions of, of the skeleton will be, for example, to form the framework, framework. You have the, the cranium. So somebody is telling me what is the difference between a skull and cranium. We will see that. Uh, the cranium, we have the thorax, we have the pelvis, and these structures basically are protecting. If you see here inside there, we have actually some structures, some, some organs. And besides that, we have the upper and lower extremities, and without those bones, without this, the skull, without the, the, uh, the thoracic cage or the rib cage, or without the pelvis, so how we will be existing, right? So we will be like amoebas, right? With big eyes here and there and moving like crawling, right? So actually the bones are going to help to do that, to protect and to make us to move, to actually have movement, okay? Mechanical activity. Protect structures like brain, spinal cord, lungs, heart, the works and levers are produce movement, store calcium is going to be a store calcium. And when you need, for example, I want to tell you, uh, First of all, calcium is needed for many reasons. If you have low levels of calcium in your blood for those activities that I just mentioned, where do you, do you think we are going to take that calcium into the blood? Exactly, from the bones. The bones are going to be a deposit, a storage, besides that forming the bones, deposit Dr. of storage G, of calcium. Me. Dr. G, yes? um, Judy is here now, I think. Okay. So let her I'm in and we will... Is somebody looking for me? <laughs> yes, Miss Judy. That's fine. Please, uh, yes, uh, attend your, to your to the lecture, okay? Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. All right. So in addition to that, the bone are, have another uh, function that is to produce blood cells. All right. So let's talk about the anatomy of the, of the bone. Talking about the anatomy of the bone, we have here this big bone. Okay, so I call this Flintstone bone. 
So, and we have, uh, we are going to talk about prototype of bone, these long bones, the upper extremity, lower extremities. And this bone, they have this area. Can you see here? That is called the ep epiphysis, epiphysis. The distal portion, so we have two epiphyses. Okay, be careful with that. We have one and two epiphyses, the proximal and the distal. All the extreme portions of the long bone are going to be formed by epiphysis, okay? In the middle portion, in the middle, if we call the diaphysis, this is the diaphysis, diaphysis, diaphysis or called shaft. Question four, you need to pay attention to this, okay? So we are doing many things simultaneously and actually that is going to help us. So please make notes about that. So we have the epiphysis and the diaphysis and the epiphysis. Uh, one thing I want to tell you, uh, do you, when you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and you uh, uh, you eat these uh, chicken chicken legs, uh, do you like to eat the bones? Yes or no? Somebody like to eat bones? <laughs> you like yeah. it, right? very, good. very good, very good. Okay, so tell me, which part of the bone is easier to chew? This portion A or this portion B? A. 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 A is easier to eat, yes or no? Yes, easier. Okay. All right. Why? Because that bone is a slightly diff is different from the bone that we have in B. So the the structure of the bone and the in uh, the epiphysis is different from the bone that we have in the diaphysis. Okay. So that's why the the bone on the epiphysis is more softer, is more easier. And we have here what we call the spongy bone. Can you see the spongy bone? Spongy bone. This is spongy bone. And then here we have, uh, where is that? There's no saying here. This is going, I'm going to call here the compact bone. The compact bone. Compact bone. Okay. Please, just visualize here. Can you see the structure of the bone here compared to this? Is different or the same? Is different or the same? Different. Is it different, right? Yeah. You see here that they have like a like a spongy. Spongy means like a sponge, right? So the sponge is going to be tra is called trabecular. We are, it's everything writing, okay? Trabecular or cancellous. So. These three names, you need to remember that. It's writing in the PowerPoint, so don't worry about that. So this is the type of bone that we have in the epiphysis. And this is the type, type of bone that we have in the diaphysis. So compact bone. Compact bone is more dense. It's more solid. It's, more, it's actually made in order to res resist tension. Okay? So that we are going to see that in a few moments. Okay. So what do we have? What do we have inside of the epiphysis why is so important why is so important what is important to talk about the uh the what is inside the the diaphysis okay let's start with the epiphysis in the epiphysis we have two main structures that is called the red bone marrow red see see here red bone marrow or you can call that just bone marrow okay the red bone marrow is here in this location. Red bone marrow. Imagine that. Try to use your imagination and try to travel into your bone. Okay. The red bone marrow are going to have the function to, there's a function that is the hematopoiesis. 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 The hematopoiesis, the function is, actually, hematopoiesis is, hemato means blood blood, correct? Poiesis means formation. So formation of structures of the blood. The hematopoiesis is going to divide it. The hematopoiesis, this is a, a, a red bone marrow, and the red bone marrow have a function that is the hematopoiesis. The hematopoiesis is going to have three, they are going to produce three different structures. Number one are going to be the red blood cells, the red blood cell. Number two is going to be the production of white cells. 
And number three is going to be the production of platelets. Okay? As you can tell, platelets, uh, based on your previous course, platelets are participate in which process? Why do we need platelets? For blood clotting factor. Exactly, for coagulation process, right? The coagulation process. The coagul we will talk about plenty about that. Why do we need white cells? To fight off infection. Defense. Fight it's off part infection. Of the immune, immune system, right? And the red blood cells are going to be needed to transport the carbon dioxide and the oxygen, correct? So one thing I want you to be super careful here is that the red blood cell production is called the erythropoiesis. P-O-S-S. Okay? So I want to remark this 10 times because many students or many people confuse between a hemato and erythropoiesis. Erythro means red, correct? So don't get confused. Hematopoiesis is not erythropoiesis. Erythropoiesis is not hematopoiesis. Erythropoiesis is part of the hematopoiesis. Okay? We got it? Why is important that? Because in the future, you will see that there is some substances that are going to people who have cancer, for example. I'm going to give you a reason why I'm, I'm make emphasis on this. People who have cancer, they are going to go into radiotherapy, right? Or they can go to chemotherapy, correct? This chemotherapy basically are going to be able to destroy part or completely the red bone marrow. So if you have radioactivity treatment for cancer or chemotherapy, you will see that basically can affect the erythropoiesis they can go down the number of red blood cells. You know how many red blood cells we produce? We produce about 2 million, 2 million new red blood cells every second. Can you imagine that? Every second. So you have every second, San Francisco and Oakland population in one second. That is the amount of people, the amount of red blood cells they produce. The white cells, they are going to produce a little bit lower, 1 million per second, and the platelets are going to produce about 1 million per second. So, as, and what happened? If you have chemotherapy, chemotherapy is going to destroy these cells. It can destroy the red blood cells or, and the white cells, or, and the platelets. So, depends. And that is important to know because the patient who has chemotherapy, they need to receive help, treatment. If the white cells are low, there is treatment for elevation of white cells. If the red blood cells are low, they have a, a treatment for that. If the platelets are low, the same thing. But for that, in NCLEX and HESI, they are going to mention the erythropoiesis. And the erythropoiesis is not hematopoiesis. So when you are talking about erythropoiesis, you are talking about red blood cells. And that's what I want you to make emphasis. Make emphasis. We okay with that? Everybody got that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Excellent. So please don't forget that ever, please. Okay, ever, ever, ever. Okay, so let's keep uh, going. So let's see what is next. Okay, we have type of bones. We have the compact bone, as you see here, the compact bone that is basically in the diaphysis, correct? And we have the cancellous, spongy, cancellous, spongy, or trabecular. Can you see this a spongy bone? Can you see like a small areas like uh, balloons here, like uh, round areas? So that is the compact, that is the cancellous spongy bone. That is what is easier to, 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 to chew. That is actually the epiphysis. It's located in the epiphysis, okay? All right, so the components, the components of the bone, so we have here the Cancellous, trabecular, or spongy. Here we have what? The cancellous, trabecular, spongy in the epiphysis. And in the center, we have the uh, compact bone. Okay, perfect. So now, other components bone marrow. Bone marrow. Why we call bone marrow? Because there is two types of bone marrow the red and the yellow. Red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. Red marrow, yellow marrow, or red bone marrow, or yellow. Uh, bone marrow 
okay so where is the yellow uh, yellow uh, bone marrow if you see here if I cut here if I cut the bone in transverse cut like this transverse so you will have the, the bone are you you're going to see like this okay all right so when you see the bone like that you will see here that the this is the outer portion of the bone and here we have like a channel it's like a tunnel this tunnel that go from all the way to the bone up here down here so there's completely a channel it's like a tunnel this channel is going to be called the medullary cavity the medullary cavity the medullary cavity what is inside of this of this medullary cavity inside of the medullary cavity we have fat this fat is what we call the yellow marrow you okay with that everybody follow me yes are you there yes yeah, dr g okay excellent all right so now i want just to take advantage of this moment and i'm going to tell you that there is some membranes that is not the bone but are membranes that belong to the bone but are not bone exactly okay there is one layer i will put it in green because or in blue that is is imagine that you have you are in a in a tunnel you pass in your car and you have a tunnel the tunnel the tunnel is called the medullary cavity medullary cavity and the tunnel is the 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 lining or the, the walls are covered by a membrane you okay with that let's imagine that this is your tunnel this is your tunnel you're looking the tunnel here the car is passing here and here this lining is going to cover by a membrane and this outer there is another membrane that is going to cover the the tunnel okay so there is two membranes outer and inner so here we are going to see that in this tunnel in the medullary canal there is a membrane that is going to cover the inner layer the inner layer that is called the endosteum endosteum and we have another layer that is outside covering the bone all the way covering the main my pulse is not that good that is called the periosteum. Can you see the periosteum here? Periosteum. Okay. And this this yellow you see here is the yellow marrow. It's like you, the yellow marrow is going through the channel, through the canal. Okay, we got it. And that is a periosteum. There you are. Periosteum is the membrane covering the shaft of the long bone. It's like you have a, a, a plastic wrap around the, the bone, that plastic that is very tight, by the way, it's very tight. And that is basically when you have a broken bone, do you have a broken bone? Okay, if, when you have a broken bone, the, the periosteum, they have a lot of terminal nerves. That That is what is causing the pain. Not the bone itself, it's the periosteum, the one who is having a lot of, of terminal nerves that is actually causing the pain. And the endosteum is the thin membrane that lines the medullary cavity. You okay with that? Everybody got it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So here we have the periosteum again. The endosteum is not seen here. They, they was lazy to draw it here. I here. guess I'm going to draw it myself. So this is the, this brown background here is the medullary canal. And here on the lining is where you're going to have the membrane that is called the endosteum. Endosteum. Okay, we got it? Okay, perfect. So, conclusion. We have the division of the bone. We have the epiphysis. Epiphysis in the distal portions of the bone. In the middle, we have the diaphysis. What is the other name of diaphysis? The shaft. The shaft. Shaft. Okay. Shaft. okay. So, we have here the 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 epiphysis and the epiphysis is going to contain what one of the contents of the uh, of the epiphysis red marrow 
red bone marrow. The red bone marrow. Okay, the red bone marrow. You okay with that? Okay, and the red bone marrow, you know, is the place where it's happening the hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis is divided in the erythropoiesis in the production of white cells and platelets. And another thing that we saw already is that the epiphysis, what kind of bone, uh, what kind of bone is, is have? The spongy or the or the uh, compact? The spongy. The spongy. And what is the diaphysis? The, the compact. Compact. Okay. All right. All right, so let's talk about the ossification center. Ossification is, as I mentioned, and we are going to talk about the, how the bone is being formed. The ossification is going to be, is the conversion of cartilage into bone. So can you see all bones at the beginning are going to be cartilage. They start to, start to form at nine weeks. So nine weeks, how much is that? Is two months and one week. Baby, pregnancy is where you start having bones. And this is an ultrasound view. And yeah, I'm not going to go into detail. This is just the ultrasound the device. And here is the spinal, sp spinal uh, the vertebra of the baby. He, this is his tail. The head is here. This is the nose. OK? And here we have this is these white areas. It's because these are the areas where initiate the deposit of calcium in the vertebra. Just to give you an example, if you have a bone that is cartilage, the cartilage start to get deposits of calcium in some centers, in certain areas, and they are going to expand, 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 expand. And those are cells who are, you already know, the osteoblasts, the osteocytes, and the osteoclasts that we are going to uh, talk in more detail. Okay. All right, so that is the ossification center. Ossification center, or center of mineralization. Miner, you want to be more elegant? Mineralization. What is the deposit of calcium in the cartilage? The concept, what I want you to remember is this. The beginning of a bone is cartilage. And then they are going to start turning into bone when the deposit of calcium arrives. We okay with that? You okay? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Sir. So, one thing I want to, if you answer, please, re really, uh, it's going to help me a lot. Okay? So we have the red bone marrow here, but there is another structure, and the last for our happiness, well, okay, that's the way we are made, is this. So we have the red bone marrow here, and here we have a line here, a line, a line. This line here and here, okay? Those are lines formed by cartilage, and that is going to be called the growth cartilage, or the growth plate, whatever you want to call Growth cartilage. This growth cartilage is, the, is actually cartilage. It's not bone yet. This, bo this uh, growth plate or growth cartilage is the one who allow the bone to elongate, means to increase in size, to be longer, to, uh, to be bigger, okay? So this growth cartilage are going to be present in kids, children. You know that a female, the female, female, uh, they actually uh, can grow up to three years after the first menstrual period. Three years after the menstrual period, that is the time that female can still grow. So three years. Why? Because estrogens are going to make close the, the growth cartilage. In male, we don't have that, uh, that we don't have uh, that uh, estrogens, right? That amount of estrogens as a girl. So what happened? We can grow even longer. So in a girl in the United States, the average for a menstrual period is about uh, uh, 12 years, 11.7 years. And you have up to 15, 16 years old is the time that you grow. Meantime, in male, we grow up to the up to 21 years old. So we have more time to grow. So that's why males are basically uh, be, uh, taller than female. You okay with that? And when is that ending? That ends when the car growth cartilage is completely replaced by calcium. 
You okay with that? Yes. Yes. All right. So here we have this. Uh, thank you. This is uh, a X-ray just to show you something. Look at this. This is this is the epiphysis of the long bone. I know this is the radius and this is the ulnar ulnar, and you see something like it's like a rupture here, like a like a fracture. Do you notice that? Do you notice that? This is supposed to be bone, right? And the bone is looking like this, white like this. That is bone. That is bone. But this area that is part of the radius bone and the ulnar bone looks like a fracture. And because the density is different, well, I'm not going to explain about X-ray, but I will tell you that is how we detect that there is the growth plate or the growth cartilage. That is the growth cartilage. So you can tell for this for this X-ray that this is a young person that is still growing. So when you have adult, uh, when you're adult, this line is lost. So that means that it's already being replaced by by calcium, and the appearance is going to look like this, white. You okay with that? And where is located? So what what do we have in the uh, at the epiphysis? We have the red bone marrow and the growth cartilage. You okay with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now, here we have some terminology that we are going to look at. All right. So for this, I'm going to take hand about this. Look at this. Let's make a close-up of this vertebra. This is one vertebra. So I'm going to draw it here, the vertebra. Let's make a vertebra like this. Let's, the vertebra is supposed to be something like that, OK? And the center of ossification is going to be here. So that is the moment they are going to start deposit calcium in order to produce the vertebra. And that is going to be circular like this. One, two. Three. So they are going to be the distribution of the elements are going to be like that. Okay. All right. So if you see here, we are going to talk about the functional unit of the of the bone. Functional unit. What is the functional unit of the bone? Somebody can tell me. Us. Oh, Very good. I know you have it just ready to say it. I know, I know. Okay, so that is the ostium. Okay, the ostium is a functional unit of the bone. Qu question? I would like to hear what is a functional unit, right? What is a functional unit? If you have, for example, a brick, this is a brick, a brick, a brick. Okay, the brick, what is that? Brick is hard, it's square. Is is uh, is uh, some color, etc. Right? What about if I make a wall of bricks? A wall of bricks. A wall of bricks. So I have many bricks together, and actually you will see that the properties of this brick is the same as the whole wall as a whole. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. So that means that this brick alone is having the same characteristics and same properties of the whole wall. Are you okay with that? So that means that is the equivalence to say the ostium. The ostium is like the brick and the whole wall is going to be the bone. So basically the bone is built up on group of ostium. Okay, ostium is the functional unit. If you have the function, if you have all the functions of the bone, of the of the whole bone, is the same function that the ostium is going to have. So that is the minimum unit, the smallest unit where they are going to get the whole function of the organ. Okay. So we have functional unit of the lungs, functional unit of the kidney. We have many functional units. We are going to talk another time. Okay. The functional unit. So this is like a legal. So legal, legal is a word. Yeah. Okay, so you want to build up some whatever a, a building with Lego. So each piece of the Lego is a functional unit because they have the whole function of the whole building. Okay, it make I'm, make myself understood or no? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. 
All right, perfect. So for this, you're going to see in the ostium, in the ostium, you're going to have some characteristics that we are going to uh, know right now uh, in a few moments. Here we have look like a like a tree, correct? For this, I would prefer to show you what is the where is the ostium. Can you see that? Where is the ostium? This is an ostium. All this an ostium. It's like like this, <laughs> like a like a paper towel. There you are, like a paper towel. Okay, see, similar paper towel. So we many paper towels are going to be each of these is an ostium. Many paper towels can build up a bone. Okay, so now here we have in the center of the ostium this piece, because if I draw, if I draw, if I draw the whole bone in cross section, I'm, I'm going to take my extra mile. This is my Flintstone bone. If I cut it like this, I'm going to have this. Oh God! I'm going to have this. Okay, and here we have in the center the medullary canal. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, yes. or no? And the medullary canal yes. is is located, thank you, in the diaphysis containing the uh, yellow marrow. That is fat, correct? Okay, but now here around this bone, around this, this is the medullary cavity where is the fat, etc. Here we have the ostions. We have ostions. I'm going to draw a little bit bigger. Ostions, 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 ostions. This in the center is the medullary canal. So don't get confused. This is the medullary canal. The medullary canal. This is the medullary canal, okay? And around here, we have the ostions. And the ostions, each of them, they have in the center one cavity where it's going to run blood vessels. I draw it with this because I don't want you to confuse with uh, with other picture. So I'm going to take one of these and I'm going to take it here. Got it? You follow me? Yes? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So m many of these are going to... I don't want you to think that this is the medullary canal, please. That is a, my, my reason. So this is just one ostium. It's a functional unit. In the ostium, we have in the center to a canal that we are going to see now. Okay. So if you see here this yellow, yellow, that is called the matrix. That is basically phosphate and, uh, and calcium. Okay, in the center, they have a vessel. They are going to be a vessel called the Herbation Canal. Why is it called Herbation Canal? Be look at this. Uh, the ostium, the other name of ostium is called the Herbation Canal. So why, what is Herbation? Herbation is the last name. It was a doctor in the, I guess in the 1700s. They they discover at the end of the 1700s they discover this uh, uh, this system. I don't know. I'm not sure. But anyhow, yeah, was a doctor at least. Okay, so ostium. So that's why this ostium that all all this is called the Herbation Herbation system. Sorry, is a Herbation system. I don't want to get confused. It's a Herbation system. In the center we have the Herbation canal. That this running actually arteries and veins. Okay? Okay, perfect. So this ostium, you see here, we have we need to know, and this is difficult to explain. We have three cells. I'm going to talk about the osteoblast. The osteoblast. Osteo means a bone, blast, junk cells. This osteoblast, I'm going to draw it like blue here are like this. This is like, this is an osteoblast. And the osteoblast is a cell that is going to crawl, is going to travel, walk. They're going to crawl. Yes, it's crawling like amoeba. And behind, they're going to leave a substance. So as, mo as they move, as they move, they are going to release a substance. That is the matrix. Okay, so there's not only one osteoblast, there is many more osteoblasts. Let's make it three of them. Three of them. 
these osteoblasts, what they are going to do is to build up bone. They have matrix here. And they are going to do, in addition, they are going to bring calcium. This matrix is like a cement. It's like, uh, it's not solid. It's a little bit kind of, let's uh, like a mass of cement, okay? So if you see, they are going around and around and around, and they are going to just produce a lot of these uh, matrix here around. There is a moment, as you see here, the the osteoblasts will not move over the the cement. They will they will not walk over the cement. So in certain moment, the osteoblasts are going to be surrounded by this substance. They don't have any place to go. They don't have any place to go. They are going to be trapped in that area. This space is this one. This space. And here inside we have the, the osteoblast. Here is the osteoblast. I will tell you the change name in a few moments. So this is an space, empty space. We okay with that? It's a space, a space, literal space. And in this space is living a guy called osteoblast. And this is after they produce this matrix, they produce right and left, until everywhere. So they are surrounded, they cannot move anymore. And the osteoblasts get trapped in these areas, in these dark areas. These dark areas, this one, black, is going to be called the lacunae. Lacunae, like a lake. Lacunae. So who is living here? Who is living here inside? The osteoblast, right? Okay. So that is, and that is what's happening like this. The ossification process that we was talking is going to start here. So this is the first portion of the ossification center. And then I told you that it's growing and growing, right? Ossification. So when they finish this, this line or this circle, they are going to continue to the next one. And when they finish that osteoblast, they are going to continue with the next one and with the next one and with the next one. You follow me? We okay with that? Yes. Okay. So the osteoblast, the osteoblast, when they get trapped here, when they get trapped here, they're going to change name. What is going to call now is going to be called the osteocyte. So that's why in the script they say here, osteocyte, can you see here, are here in this cell. So, but what is an osteocyte? An osteocyte is not a different cell. Osteocyte, osteocyte is just a change of the name of the osteoblast. When the osteoblast get trapped in the lacunae, that osteoblast now is changed name and is called an osteocyte. In other words, what is an osteocyte? Osteocyte is a mature osteoblast. Are we okay with that? Yes. Okay. Okay. So these osteoblasts, they are going to produce a matrix, but in addition, they are going to add calcium. They are going to add calcium. They are going to call calcium, calcium come, and they are going to come and deposit in the matrix. And that is going to get harder structure. You okay with that? Okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, uh, okay, so, all right. So this, I'm going to make mention a few more things here. So these areas, this one area, another area here, and another circle here. These circles, these limits, are each of them <coughs> are going to be called a lamella. So can you see here? Lamella. So this circle is a lamella. Other circle, lamella. Lamella, lamella, lamella. Okay? All right. So the other thing that we need to remember is this. The osteocyte, the osteoblast, the osteoblast is like this. Something like that. The osteocyte is something different. The osteoblast is going to be something like that. They are going to have like tentacles, like uh, like octopus, like this. Something like that. And that is the osteocyte. The so osteocyte that is living here, the osteocyte, these projections of this cell membrane are going to go to this line. Can you see this? Can you see this? So the osteocyte is going to go 
the, pro the elongations of their arms are going to go to these structures. And what is the purpose of that? Is to communicate other osteocytes. So the osteocytes are going to communicate to each other. So from the distance, they are going to communicate each other. How? They're going to do some messages, some, uh, neuro some um, substances that are going to, for example, they are going to share nutrients, etc. Okay, the osteocyte. All right, so what is the function of the osteoblast in conclusion? It is the formation of a bone. How we are going to form the bone? To bring, listen to this, bring calcium from blood and the deposit into the bone. So, simple, please. Osteoblasts, what is doing? Deposit calcium in the bone. Deposit calcium into the bone. Deposit calcium in the bone. Osteoblast, what is doing? Deposit calcium in the bone. Are you okay with that? Yes. Everybody got it? Yes, yeah. just bring it down. Okay, somebody can help me with the time, please. I don't know if I have uh, one hour already or not, so let Six me know, please. Okay? Minutes, sir. Huh? Six, Six what? Six two twenty two. Two twenty two. Oh, so it's exactly one hour, right? Yes. Um, okay, let's have ten minutes break. Okay, I will see you. Uh, at 632. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. If somebody have a question or doubt or something, just let me know, please. You can call me or you can call me. I'm not going to be in my in front of my computer right now. Okay, just to tell you that I'm doing, I'm trying to put together things in order to go the slides more easily because it's a lot, a lot of a lot that is coming.
Let's start. Hello, are you there? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Let's continue. Okay, so I think this break here in this moment was good because it's let's restart again okay so here we have so what what cell we have inside here first of all how is called this opening how is called this lacunae La right everybody please lacunae okay how, how is this line called Yeah, lamela. Lamela. Doctor, can you see the lines that you're drawing? Sorry? I can't really follow it. The line is this. Can you see this line? Where are you pointing to? No, I'm drawing. Do, don't you see it? Okay, now I can, yes, okay. 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 So that is what, all right, so perfect. So we are going to start talking about the, uh, the components of the, of the bone. We have the Herbation Canal, that is this canal that you see here. This is one, this is one ostion, and then in the center we have arteries and veins that is running through the Harvation Canal, this canal. Okay? Everybody's uh, oriented, right? So we okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. So, all right, so let's talk about the compact bone. The compact bone is located in the called cortical bone, we don't call that often, just compact bone, it's in the diaphysis, okay? And there, uh, um, and this actually, uh, they are going to be located in the shaft of the bone called diaphysis, it surrounds the yellow marrow, as we already know, okay? So what is the uh, function of this type of bone? Is to have, uh, to be resistant to mechanical forces. So it's going to be very uh, stiff and dense, and that is going to protect structures, okay? Osteon is where we find the osteon. The osteon basically we found in the, in the, in the compact bone, in the compact bone. So here we have a, a draw here, you have each osteon. We have the central canal or Herbation canal. This is the center. Forget about the Wolkan canal, those are horizontal canals. This is a Wolkan, Wolkman canal, just to show you, but it's not important, I'm not going to ask you. And we have the osteocytes. What is the function of the osteocytes? Who can tell me? Functions of the osteocyte is to repair and maintain the bone. And maintain the bone. Okay? Maintain the bone. So that are the function of the osteocyte. What is the function of the osteoblast? What is the function of osteoblast? Deposit calcium to the bone. Calcium to Into the, the bone. bone. Excellent. So everybody, okay, perfect. All right, so let's keep going. We have the osteocyte, and remember it is this. This osteocyte, the osteoblast is like this. The osteocyte is like this. And you see these projections of the cytoplasm, like, a, like an octopus. So this is lacunae is where is located the osteocyte. The osteocyte is in a cavity called the lacunae. Okay, and they are going to send projections to communicate to other osteocytes. All right, so maintain and repair, period. That is osteocyte. Other way to, to talk about the osteocyte is that is a, a mature osteoblast. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. Then we have another cells that are going to be the osteoclast. The osteoclast. What is doing the osteoclast? The osteoclasts are other cells. Osteoclast. 
that are going to be the opposite of the osteoblast. So what they are, what are doing the osteoclasts? Who can tell me? Take the calcium out of the bone. Okay, so they are going to take calcium out from the bone and put it back into the blood, correct? Okay, we okay with that? Yes. So we have osteoblast. We have osteoclast. And we have bone, we have the blood here. And here we have the, the bone. So what is doing the calcium? Osteoblasts are going to go from the blood to the bone. And the osteoclasts go from the bone to the blood. Okay, to simplify. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's go and the video I always, for some reason, the video is not loading, but I have the, the website there, when you have. We are going to see the video, it's two minutes video. This guy. Okay, let's start. This is the osteoblast, and the story of the osteoblast and osteoclast. So we are getting into the bone. We are going to the bone, and you will see these vessels that are the uh, uh, vessels of the herbation system in the osteum. And here we have, first of all, our friend, the osteoclast. This osteoclast, what they are doing is traveling over the bone, traveling over the bone, making the, basically are uh, releasing the calcium can you see the dust floating around them there you are can you see that that is actually the osteoclasts the osteoclasts are releasing the calcium from the bone remember that calcium is needed for many functions when the calcium is low in blood for muscular contraction and nervous uh, uh, nervous system electrical impulse if there is low they are going to take it out from the bone and here we have our friends, the osteoblasts. These osteoblasts are doing the opposite. If they, if you see here, they are depositing behind them a matrix, this matrix. So the rule here or the game here is they cannot go over the matrix or osteoid. Okay. So then what they are doing, the osteoblast is to deposit calcium into the bone. And they start to form the bone itself. If you see here, the osteo so there is a moment that they cannot go anywhere else because they are surrounded by this matrix or osteoid and they are staying in place in the lacunae. Now then they are going to change name into osteocyte. See, there you are. They cannot move anymore because they are surrounded. And what they are going to come? The osteocyte. And you see the branches of the osteocyte? They communicate between each other. The osteocyte. What is the function of the osteocyte? Repair and to maintain the bone. You okay? And that was our trip to the bone. Okay? Yes. Everybody's clear on that, so you 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 have uh, osteocytes and osteoblasts. Um, okay, so let's move it. All right, so let's talk about the, that is, that osteoblast an osteoclast and osteocyte basically are located in the in the compact bone. So, so. Are going to be located in the compact bone. Now it's turn to talk about the spongy bone, cancellous bone, or trabecular bone. Okay? Basically, what they are doing, we are located in the epiphysis. Epiphysis. The epiphysis is the soft area when you eat the the the, the leg of the of the chicken, right? So, and the function is basically more metabolic uh, than the combat. So, basically, in the spongy is where we're going to have the red bone marrow. Metabolic, right? So, they are going to produce a lot of red blood cells through the erythropoiesis, white cells, and platelets. Why are you repeating that so many times? Because that's the way. So, to 
to click with the information, okay? To, to keep the information, and that's why I repeat many times. And the second thing that we have in the, in the, in the epiphysis are going to be the growth cartridge, correct? We got it? Got it. Yes. Okay. okay, so this is all news already. So you're familiar with these guys, right? These guys are coming in this direction, in this direction. There is a moment that... We can't hear you, Dr. G. We can't hear you. Okay, we got it. We, we couldn't hear you, Dr. G. Since when? When you last said about the growth cartilage and then it cut out. Okay. All right, so again, let's repeat it again. So he, thank you, thank you so much. So we have in the PVC, we have the red bone marrow and we have the growth cartilage, the growth cartilage. These growth cartilage are located in the epiphysis okay just remember we have the red bone marrow red bone marrow produce the red blood cells plus the white cells plus the platelets okay so this is all news we already know what is doing this osteoblast the osteocyte and the osteoclast we have the epiphyseal plates epiphyseal plates that epiphyseal plates are called the growth cartilage Can you see the growth cartilage here? One, two, three, right? So they are going to become more thinner and thinner and thinner. So see, this line is even smaller from the previous uh, uh, what we saw, right? So uh, these plates are going to be ready to fuse. Probably this is about 13, 14 years old person. If this is a girl, it's a boy, probably is going to be about 20, 19 years old. Okay, so I'm going, we are not going to talk about the components of the bones because they are actually not needed. We are going to talk now about the uh, bones of the skeleton. All right, so this is, when you see this head here, this is open eyes, open ears. So please, this is very, very important. Okay, so we have the the bones skeleton the skeleton are going to divide into axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton. 80 and 126, you don't need to remember the name, the number of the bones. If you don't want it, that's fine. So axial skeleton is everything that is in the center of the body. The head, the skull, the trunk, the, all the, all the uh, vertebras, the pelvis are going to be part of the axial skeleton everything that is in the center. Now, the appendicular skeleton, very easy, appendicular is like appendix, right? The appendicular is hanging somewhere, right? These actually are the upper and the lower extremities. You okay with that? Yes. So, so what are the two main groups of bones? You must know that. Axial and appendicular, okay? Now, let's talk about the framework of the skull. So can somebody tell me the skull and the cranium is the same or is different and why? Is different or is the same to say skull and cranium? The same, the same. No, okay, so let's learn that. The skull, the skull is the whole head. I mean, not the whole head, it's the bony portion of the head, the skull, okay? Okay, you follow me? Next. This is divided into the cranium and the facial bones. So, facial bone, we don't have one bone, we have many bones. Okay, facial bone, all the bones that are on the face, that is part of the skull. And everything that is behind the, the facial bones is called the cranium. Cranium, Facial bones, facial bones, cranium. You okay with that? Yes. Okay, cranial and facial bones. So all together are going to be called a skull. 
You okay with that? Yes. Oh, yes. Perfect. So let's talk about the bones. This is another question, high yield, high yield question. We have the frontal bone. We have one frontal bone. But here, please, I want you to pay attention to this. But many people think the frontal bone is out to here. No, do you think it's up to here? No, it's going to be all the way up. Can you see? Almost to the up portion of the head. Okay? So that is the frontal bone. How many frontal bones we have? One. 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 One frontal bone. Now let's go to the occipital bone here. Occipital bone is the posterior bone of the, of the cranium. Or the skull if you want. In this case, that's a main difference. So this is the occipital bone. How many occipital bones we have? One. One. Okay. Then we have two parietal bones. Parietal bones is this one. One parietal bone here. And another parietal bone. We have two parietal bones. Then we have the temporal bone. Temporal bone is this. Temporal uh, bone is this. This temporal lobe we have right and left. So how many temporal we have? We have actually the uh, uh, we have the right and left temporal. Then we have one ethmoidal bone. I will show you the ethmoidal bone. Let me see. Don't go. This is the so if you look if you look the cranium from above, you see here the tip of the of the of the ethmoidal bone. The ethmoidal bone is like a blade. They are going to go down to the nose. So please use your imagination. So let me see. This is the ethmoidal bone. So here is the, when you was looking from above, that is where the, you're looking from above. And you will see that the ethmoidal bone is like a, like, uh, like, a, like a wall coming all the way perpendicular. All this is the ethmoidal bone. Ethmoidal bone is, what is important to know is the ethmoidal bone is not a facial bone. Ethmoidal bone is a cranial bone. You okay with that? And the other bone that we are going to look at is the esphenoidal bone or esphenoids. This esphenoid bone looks like a vampire or like a bat. That is actually the esphenoidal bone. So we have one ethmoidal, one esphenoidal, we have two temporals, we have one uh, occipital. The parietal is too low, so the cut, so here's the parietal, one and two. Okay. And uh, what else? And the temporal are going to be one and two. So how many bones we have in the in the cranium? Eight. 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 Don't forget that. Okay. We have four that are one and two are going to be a pair. Parietal and temporal. Parietal and temporal. Okay. Okay. Facial bones. Facial bones are fourteen facial bones. This is not all the facial bones. How many? Three, six, nine, ten. So there's more. There's four more. All right. So just remember the facial bone. Facial bone. We have the jaw. How many jaws do you have? One. And that jaw is cranial, cranial or facial bone. Facial. Facial bone, okay. The maxilla, the maxilla, the palate, right up. How many maxillas we have? One or two, or three? Two. We have two maxillas. Excellent. So how we are going to see? Look at this. Uh, where is the maxilla? Okay, here. Probably are going to make it bigger. Okay, so it's looking from below. Here is the oral cavity. This is the palate. And you can see here one maxilla. This is one maxilla. And there is another maxilla here. So how many maxilla we have? Two maxillas. More, uh, a little bit behind or more posterior, we have two bones that are called the palatine. That's what is coming the word palate. Palatine. Palatine to palatine. 
So what I want you to remember about the maxilla, and I don't want you to get confused between the the uh, up, uh, the mandible, that is the jaw, and the upper jaw, that is the maxilla. Then we have the zygomatic bone, zygomatic bone. Zygomatic bone is the cheekbone, is the cheekbone, okay? Okay, so uh, if you have a baby, or you had a baby already, uh, you see, you will notice that in the, his or her head is going to be like a very kind of soft area. Do you notice that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So that is called a fontanel. Fontanel. So just a moment, I need to remind you because I forgot to mention that. We have the fontanel. What is the fontanel? Fontanel. Remember the bones that the of the of, of, of the cranium are going to be the um, the frontal bone. The front. So by the way, cranial bones is from here. Look at my fingers. Oh, you cannot see my fingers. Okay, so please, can you see my, my, my fingers on my face? Yes. Yeah. Okay, the, if you cut here like this, oblique, you will see here the facial. So from here, that is the facial bones. The cranial bones including this portion too, all the way back. That is the cranium. That is the cranium. Cranium, and here you have the, actually the facial bones. Special bones. Okay? All right. So in the cranium that you see here in the in the right upper picture, you have a, a neonate or newborn with these openings. When you born, the the fusion of the bones are not being done yet. When you born, the bones are not fused yet. The bones are not fused yet. Okay? And what happened is that there are going to be a space that are going to fill it up bit by bit with the time. These openings are going to help during the delivery because the head can uh, basically change a little bit of shape in order to help the baby to uh, be uh, delivered. That is going to be the fontanelles. We have five types of fontanelles. You need to remember only one, basically, is the anterior fontanelle and another one the posterior, mastoid, etc. There are many others. We have here, this is the anterior fontanel. They are going to close in about one year. The posterior in about six months. Okay? All right. Now, uh, before I go to the next thing, I want to mention this. Everybody, which bone is this? in purple. Uh, Which one is that? Occipital bone. Occipital bone. Occipital bone. Occipital. I know. Occipital, occipital bone, right? Occipital, occipital bone. And what you saw? Exactly. Excellent. And here we have what? This is an opening. This opening is called a foramen magnum. Question for the exam. Foramen magnum. Where belongs the, uh, the where is located the foramen magnum in the occipital bone? Okay. And what is the function of this occipital bone? This is again here we have the foramen magnum here coming. And what is going to happen is that we have the medulla oblongata, cerebellum here. Here we have the brain stem, and here is going to pass the here. Above this line is going to be the medulla oblongata. Lower than that is going to be the spinal cord. The spinal cord. So that is how the ex how the spinal cord is going to exit the cranial cavity in order to go to the spinal spinal vertebral canal. Okay, we got it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about the sinuses. Talking about the sinuses, 
uh, talking about the sinuses, the sinuses are going to have this, uh, uh, this is a review, by the way, I'm going to show you now here. Look at this. Here we have sinuses. Sinuses means cavities. And these cavities are located where? In the, in the, uh, in the skull, okay? So what is doing these cavities? These cavities are going to be filled with, with air and actually some fluid because it's, have, it's covered by a mucosa that produce some kind of secretions, some secretions. So we have the frontal sinuses, the frontal sinuses, we have the maxillary sinuses, we have the ethmoidal sinuses in yellow, and we have the sphenoidal sinuses. I say sinuses because they're actually a pair of them. Okay? So, if you see here, look at this. These guys are going to be cavities that they have many functions. I'm going to tell you the functions now. They're going to give you the resonance of your voice. The resonance of your voice. The resonance of your voice. Okay? So, the characteristic of your voice. These chambers that are going to make like a resonance. Decrease weight of the skull because there are hollow cavities, hollow areas. They're going to basically decrease the, the, the weight of the skull. It's going to moisture and warm air, shock absorbers, etc. But the first two is the one you must remember. Okay? So these sinuses, you already know what is the function of them, resonance and decrease the weight of the skull. They are going to communicate. They are going to drain. So each of these sinus are going to drain into the nose. So you have a cavity here. Sorry, you have here the cavity, and they are going to drain into the nasopharynx. The same from the frontal bone. They are going to drain into the nasopharynx. The ethmoidal and the sphenoidal. They have channels that are going to drain, drain into the into the nasopharynx, into the nose. Okay. So now this. Uh, and these sinuses, when they are get blocked because so you have some cold or you have some inflammation on the throat, these channels that are going to end into the nose are going to be blocked. And what happened? Air and fluid are trapped in the sinus. So eventually, a few hours, a day or two days, you start to develop an infection. Remember all these sinuses. How many sinuses do we have? We have two frontals, one pair. We have uh, a, a two maxillaries. We have two ethmoidals and we have two sphenoidals. So we have four pairs. We have eight sinuses. Take note about this. The largest sinus is the maxillary sinus. The maxillary sinus. And that is the actually the most common who is going to produce Sinusitis, sinusitis. Sinusitis. What is in sinusitis? It's an inflammation of the sinus. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, somebody tell me about the time, please, okay? Seven o'clock. Okay. So let's keep going. Um, all right, so thank you so much. We have the uh, vertebra and we have the cerve cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal vertebra, or coccyx, right? So we have uh, how many pairs of ribs? 12. 12. 12. How, the, how many pairs of ribs? 12. 12, 12. ribs, right? 12 ribs. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, 12 ribs, leave it, like that. Leave, it, leave it like that for a moment. How many cervical vertebrae we have? Seven. 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 Can you do this, please? Can you see my face? Can you see? Can you do here your neck like that? And with your finger, you're going to go from here and all the way down. And you will feel the, the big bone, like a big bulging bone. Can you pulp it? Did you touch it? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. That bone that you see, the, the, the whole bone, including the whole bone, not the upper border, everything on that bone, is 
does the vertebra cervical seven. Okay, that is what we call C7. Okay, and what does it mean? That means that that is the end of the neck. That is the end of the neck. Okay, so we have seven cer cervical vertebra. How many thoracic we have? 12, uh -huh. correct? 12. 12. Lumbar, thoracic, we have lumbar, vertebra, we have five. five. Sac sacral vertebra, we have five. 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 But what happened with the sacral? Thank you. The sac what happened with the sacral? They are being fused. They are fused. They are being fused. They are not having articulation. And the last one, that is the tailbone, called the tailbone colloquially, is the coccyx. The coccyx contain four vertebras, four. So four vertebras that are fused and not moving. The one who has certain moving, certain move is actually the rest, the cervical, thoracic, and the lumbar. Cervical seven, thoracic 12, lumbar five. Right? right. Sacral five. And the scox is four. Okay? okay? Okay, so let's go back to the ribs. Okay, so how many vertebras we have in the thoracic portion? 12. 12. How many ribs we have? How many pairs of ribs? 12. 12, right? So yeah. I said the we have 12 pairs of ribs. 12, 12, 12. And we have 12 thoracic vertebras. Yes or no? Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. that is not a coincidence. So for every vertebra, for every vertebra you have, you have a pair of ribs attached to the vertebra. So if we have 12 uh, thoracic vertebra, the 12 thoracic vertebra are going to attach posteriorly to the ribs uh, directly. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. So you know where the, where the neck ends, right? You already know that. Yes. So, yes. And believe, uh, and please don't don't tell me that we have ribs on the neck. We don't have ribs on the neck, right? The ribs are going to be at the level of T T1, thoracic vertebra one, T1, T2, T3, T10, T11, T12. So the T12 they have attached posteriorly directly to the to the rib. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now the the thorax, the, the ribs are going to divide it in true, in true ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs. Simple. The true ribs, and that is anteriorly, eh? anteriorly. You know that posteriorly, posteriorly, everybody is attached to the vertebra. But anteriorly is different story. Anteriorly is going to be in relation with the sternum, with the sternum. The seven first vertebra, uh, first, the seven first uh, uh, ribs, are going to be attached directly to the sternum, directly to the sternum. So there is no in between anything. So directly to the sternum. So that's why it's called true ribs. The false ribs, the false ribs are the ribs that who are going to attach to the sternum, but not directly. They're going to be attached through a cartilage, a cartilage. So the ribs are going to end continuous cartilage, and the cartilage is the one who get attached to the to the sternum. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. And the floating ribs, please, these ribs are not floating, okay? They're not floating. These ribs are actually the last two ribs, the, the 11 and 12. 11 and 12. 11 and 12. These floating ribs are attached to the vertebra, T, uh, T11 and T12, but anteriorly are not attached or linked to any other structure. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about the, uh, the shoulder. 
So here we have the seven. Oh, by the way, I want you to tell to know this. Uh, for example, which number of rib is a, a floating rib? Eleven. Ten. 12. Eleven. 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 Twelve. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Exactly, 11 and 12. There's a common mistake. They, they, so I know this, they answer very fast and they make a mistake. So read carefully the question, please, okay? So the first seven are, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, true reads. Eight, nine, 10 are going to be the false read. And the last two, 11 and 12. Or you can say 11, 12, the false, one to seven is the, the true and in between. So, okay, are going to, 8 to 10 are going to be the false ribs. 8, 9, 10, 3 ribs. Okay? Okay. All right, so talking about, the, uh, sorry? Okay, talking about the shoulder. Okay, so look at this shoulder. The shoulder is composed basically by the humerus by the scapula, so uh, you call shoulder blade, right? Don't call shoulder blade, okay, it's the scapula. And we have the uh, clavicle, don't call collar, collar bone. Well, for patients or for people who are not in the medical field, it's, it's okay to say, but between us, between colleagues, or between your friends or your classmates, just talk properly, right? The collar bone, the collar, but not the collar bone, is the clavicle. All right, so look at this. If you see here, this scapula, scapula, what is the connection of the scapula? The connection of the scapula is nothing here. So the scapula, when you are going to, when you are doing this, look at this. The scapula is like that. But when you're hugging like that, your scapula is going to do this. Open. Okay? The scapula is going to do open. Why is that important? Why? Because when you're going to use your stethoscope, your stethoscope, right? You don't want to put the stethoscope over bone. So you will never put your stethoscope on the, on the top of the, of the scapula. You, I mean, o, o, over the scapula. Because you are, what you're trying to release, the bone? The bone is not going to give you any sound. So what they're doing is, the scapula is doing this. So what we need to do is this. When you are going to examine the patient, you need to ask the patient to do this, to, to hug himself, okay, or the arms in front. And what happened? The scapula is going to open like that. And what is going to uh, help that for is that there is more space to auscultate with a stethoscope, okay? So the scapula is attached to the clavicle and, uh, and the arm and the uh, humerus. So how in the world the upper extremity get stick together to the rest of the body? How is so strong attached to the, to the body? The scapula is floating and the scapula is, is actually articulated with the humerus. It's floating, so there is no support. They are going to attach to the clavicle here in this area, but everything is moving. The shoulder is very flexible, right? All right, up, anterior, posterior, superior, whatever. So the only articulation that is going to make attach the upper extremity to the to the trunk is the is the uh, articulation between the sternum and the clavicle is the sternoclavicular articulation. So here's the sternum. Here's going to be the sternum. This is the sternum, and this articulation is the only one who are going to make the upper extremity be close to the, to the, to your body. All right, so we have the pelvic bone, we have the ilium ischium pu uh, pubis. Uh, ilium uh, is like uh, the ears of an elephant. Pubic bone is what is in red here, it's in red, pubic bone. We have the uh, ischium. What is the ischium? The ischium, I want you to sit down in your chair like this and try to feel the bones of your, of, 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 of your, in your in your bottom and uh, what you feel that bone is actually the ischial bone you okay with that 
All right, so yeah. this helium, ischium, and pubic bone are not fused at the beginning. They are going to fuse later on. Okay? Okay, I need coffee. Okay, so let's talk about the lower extremity. In the lower extremity, you have this one. You have the, we have the thigh and we have the leg here, right? You know that, right? The thigh. Thigh is going to be formed by the femur. And, uh, and the leg, this is the leg. The leg is from here to here. That is leg. This is here, the, uh, the thigh, okay? All right, so let's talk about the leg. The leg has two bones. Here we have the tibia. What is the tibia? Tibia and the fibula. Okay? All right, so now, what does it mean? What is what we need? I want to ask you, first of all, which bone is more medial? The tibia or the fibula? Tibia. Yeah. Which yeah. bone is more medial? The tibia or the fibula? Tibia. Tibia. The what? Tibia. 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 The tibia, right? All right, so how to remember that? Probably I do. Very good. I, I think it's a delay of my answers, right? Okay, in yeah. your answer. So, I mean, the, I don't know. Coming late the sound. Okay, so here we have, and thank you, here we have the tibia. The tibia is more medial, as you, as you can say. Probably I told you that, how to remember this. So, can you see this, the biggest bone in the leg is the tibia? Yes? Yes. Yes, yes or no? Yes. yes. Which is the, what is the, which one is the biggest toe? The big toe, right? Yeah, the first toe. Yes, exactly. And this first toe or, or, or big toe is going to be more medial or more lateral? Medial. Medial, medial. Can you hear us? <laughs> Dr. G, I think you froze. Okay. So how to remember that? You remember this, the, the biggest bone that is the tibia is going to be on the same side of the biggest toe. Just to remember, mm -hmm. the big bone tibia are going to be on the same side of the big toe. So you see your big toe, medially, that bone that you feel is the tibia. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. And the other, another one, fibula, fibula is more lateral or medial. How to remember that? Lateral. Do you know? Okay. Small, like you, the thing, smallest thing at okay. all. Okay. What about if I say fibula, fibula, fibula. Lateral. <laughs> Excellent. Easy, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's keep going with the, uh, with the bones. We have osteoporosis, payet disease, and osteomalacia. Osteoporosis basically happening in uh, women who are a menopause stage. Women in United You're cutting out, Dr. G. Okay, so you cut, you why does that happen? We can hear you, Dr. Okay. G. Can you hear me now? Oh, I'm going to cut my video camera, okay? Okay, probably that can improve a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, so we have disorders of the bone. Uh, okay, we have different problems. Number one, I want you to talk about osteoporosis. Osteoporosis basically is happening in women who are menopause. Do you hear me before that? In the before cut it? No, that's no. how we stop no? hearing you. Okay. okay, osteoporosis basically happen in female after menopause. Okay. Why? Because why female, right? Why menopause? What are you talking about, right? So actually women in menopause are going to read average in the United States is fifty one point two years old. 51 years old is the average. At 55, all females are going to be menopause. Okay, so what is going on with the bone here? So uh, I say that because before menopause, you are menstruating, right? Women, females keep menstruating, right? Mm -hmm. Bit by bit, less and less, but still menstruating. So that means that the levels of estrogens are high. And are, and are higher than after menopause because females start to produce less estrogens during the menopause and after. Okay? During the fertile age, 14 to 45, that's the highest amount of estrogen you can have in your body, are going to have a function. These estrogens are, are helping one of the many functions of the estrogens, we can do like 20 functions of the estrogens, but one of the functions of the estrogens is to promote the deposit of calcium into the bones. You okay with that? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that, sir? Okay. Yeah, estrogens promote the deposit of calcium in the bones, into the bones. You got it? Yes. Yes. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. <laughs> yes, we okay. got it. Yes. yes, we got it. All right. So that means the estrogen is helping, but when you are menopause, you don't have that estrogen anymore. Right? And that's why you start to lose calcium. You okay? Yep. Yes. You follow me? Hello? Yes, yeah. Yes, doctor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Osteoporosis. <laughs> so for osteoporosis, we have, we have, we have, thank you. Okay. 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 Osteoporosis is going to be the low density, the density of the bone is going to be low. And they are going to have risk for fractures, especially hip, fra fra uh, hip fractures. Paget disease is an osteoiris deformance, but I want to focus in the osteomalacia. Osteomalacia, osteomalacia is means osteo means bone malacia softening, so soft bones. And what happened here is that basically it can be many reasons: deficiency of calcium, deficiency of vitamin D, or both of them. Osteomalacia is called in adults the low levels of so uh, calcium in the bones, making the bones softer. In children, it's called the rickets disease. Rickets, rickets disease. Okay, open eyes, open ears with that. Okay, so talking about tumors, tumors we have, uh, for example, the osteosarcomas, the oste the chondrosarcomas. The the benigns are going to be called like this: osteoma. Osteoma. The cancer will be osteosarcoma. We have uh, chondromas. The the malignancy. This is benign. This is benign. Chondrosarcomas. We have uh, lipomas. Are going to be liposarcoma. Okay, so. At this moment, I want you to differentiate what does it mean, sarcoma. Okay, so there is two main types of cancers. One cancer, one type of cancer is the adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma. And the other one is the sarcoma. 
basically the majority of cancer are coming from epithelial tissue. And the majority of sarcomas coming from the connective tissue. Okay? So between, we have adenosarcoma of the stomach, adenocarcinoma of the liver, adenocarcinoma of the, of the kidney, renal adenocarcinoma, okay? pancreatic adenocarcinoma, gastric adenocarcinoma, hepatic adenocarcinoma, okay? And sarcoma. Sarcoma is when it's connective tissue. For example, we have osteoma, os bone is connective tissue. Chondro uh, are connective tissue. Fat, lipoma is connective tissue. Between adenocarcinoma and sarcoma, much more aggressive, a lot much more aggressive, ten, no ten times, Four, five times more aggressive are the sarcomas. So sarcomas is not really good. Sarcoma is really aggressive. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Osteomyelitis means inflammation or, in, or infection of the bone. That bacteria that are cause a lot of pus. Pyogenic. So please, pyogenic. Right? We'll make note it here. Pyogenic bacteria means a bacteria that produces a lot of pus. Osteomyelitis. Very painful, by the way. Tuberculosis is actually, uh, with the tuberculosis is, you know, tuberculosis is not only the lungs. You know that, right? I'm yes. cut it or, or no? Okay. Yes. The tuber tuberculosis can happen on the on the lungs, why? Right? Especially there because this guy, this Mycobacterium tuberculosum, that is a bacteria, are they like oxygen? So the best place in the body is that lung. But this Mycobacterium tuberculosum can affect the can affect the skin. Tuberculosis of the skin, tuberculosis of the bone. In this case, is called the pot disease. Pot disease. Oh, this is open eyes open here for that. It can happen in the kidneys. Tuberculosis of the kidneys. Tuberculosis of the adrenal gland. Tuberculosis of the brain. So tuberculosis can happen any place, not only the lungs. Okay. So wherever there's uh, tuberculosis, there's also okay. Sorry. Sorry, what did you say? Sorry. No, it's okay. It likes oxygen, okay. wherever the oxygen goes, right? Yeah, they prefer, but they live in other areas that there is, there is no so much oxygen. Okay. But the tuberculosis can live any place. Okay, so just to finish this part, I go into, I don't know if I draw it properly. What is that? It's a flower, right? Flower. Okay. This is this is the leaf. <laughs> the flower is very strange. Okay, so this is the stem, That's the stem, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So they, then you're coming. You're upset. Well, don't do that. Okay, it's just for it. So what you're doing is to bend the plant like this by 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 accident. You bend it like this. So it's going to go like this and then come back. Okay. Okay. So what happened? the plant then is not going to stay standing anymore. They're going to be weak, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And what is that happening? So what happened is that when you fold, the, you bend the, the stem, this portion is being breaking, break it. It's not separated totally, but it's being broken. Okay, so as a plant, we have the bones of the, of the, of children, kids are going to be very elastic. And basically, the, the most common fracture in pediatrics, you need to know that forever, please, okay, is the green stick. The green stick. It's like a folding, a, a, a green stick, right? So the green stick is not broken, but it's going to get weaker, the, the, uh, the, the, the stick, correct? So that is the fracture that you have here, is in pediatrics, PEDS. That is going to be one of the most common, the green stick, green stick what? Fracture. Fracture. Okay. Yes. Okay, so that is both. Any question? 
No. Okay, so let's have a more uh, a break, right? You want break or no? You want break? Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay, let's go to break. So I will see you at eight o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. G. Okay. See you then. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, let me know, please. Dr. G, uh, going back to the grades, um, you said that it was ready and accessible, but where do we find our grades? In Jeji. In Jeji? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay.
Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi, Dr. G. How are you? Good. Hi, Dr. G. Let's continue with our lecture. And uh, yeah, let's go to page number one of the Silla of the the what of the lecture okay <clears throat> let's continue okay so uh, today we are going to complete our lecture and that is the first part uh, of the oh well, this is the first part of the lecture we just switch so integumentary system and body temperature is uh, that is what is the topic today okay so uh, we have here uh, that the skin is going to consist of three layers, okay? First of all, integumentary system means skin, okay? Skin and oil, everything that covers the body. For example, we have, we already talked in, in lecture number two, integumentary system will be the skin, the hair, is going to be the nails, okay? And this is very important. Why? Because uh, in the nursing process, when you're doing to assess your patient, the physical exam, the first thing you're going to check is the skin. The, when you're doing a, a, a head to toe uh, uh, assessment. Okay, so let's talk about the skin. And why is important about this? Uh, what is important about the skin? And we are going to talk about nursing considerations about the, the skin. Okay, let's start. We have the epidermis. Epidermis, we have the dermis, and we have the subcutaneous tissue or the hypodermis. Okay, so let's go to our picture. So we have here, number one, epidermis, dermis, and the subcutaneous layer, or tissue. So we have here the epidermis. I will show you what is epidermis. Look at this, please. People get confused that epidermis is this only. And that is not the, that is not the only portion of the epidermis. That is the outer layer of epidermis. Epidermis is going to be all this. Can you see? Yes. All this is the epidermis. The epidermis itself is going to contain five layers. The epidermis alone, okay? The, the, skin, the skin is going to have three layers. The epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. The epidermis is going to contain five layers by itself. Okay, we got it? Okay. So, talking about the epidermis, uh, we are going to see, I want to ask you, uh, why is it important in nursing to know about the skin? Number one, do you notice that a, a baby, the, how is the skin of a baby? The baby skin is very soft, right? Very, very, very delicate, we, we call that, right? And the, and the opposite, the elderly person, elderly, very old person, the skin, how is the skin? Very thin or very, very uh, thick? Thin. Thin, right? So in both cases, uh, compared with the adult, the, there is a difference bet between the skin. For example, the skin is going to change uh, appearance and texture every seven years. The skin is changing every day. Layer by layer is a slough off. Layer by layer is a slough. We are going to see that in a few moments. But definitely the skin is going to change with the time for different factors, right? And we are going to see that in the next slide. Second, tell me, the, the, the skin is, uh, is the same skin, you have a skin uh, in your body, is the same skin than, for example, the, your, your arms, your, your back, your chest, your abdomen, your hands are going to be the same, the same skin? It's going to be the same or it's going to be different? Different. Different, right? It's going to be some something different, right? And what is the difference? The difference is about how thick is the skin. How thick is the skin? For example, where is where do you think the, the your skin is the thickest uh, 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 part of uh, in what part of your body you have the thickest skin? The soles of your feet. In your feet, right? Your feet and your hands, 
right? So those are actually the more thicker areas where we have more depth of the skin. Why is that? Because you are uh, touching scenes, you're grabbing scenes, you're holding scenes, you're walking. So those areas of the skin are needed to be more thicker. You okay with that? Okay. Yeah. So now, so we we know, I will tell you, uh, first of all, in elderly people, you need to be very careful with the skin. Uh, the skin, especially at the level of the epidermis, the, the changes are going to happen in epidermis. And let's start doing this. So here we have this picture that is a real picture of, uh, uh, of the skin in the microscope. And you will see here that where is the epidermis? Epidermis is this, look at this. All this is, including this portion. Epidermis, 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 epidermis. You okay with that? Okay, so this epidermis, you will see here that we have certain layers, layers. This layer, for example, is going to be called, is the base of the epidermis. This is the base of the epidermis. So that is called the stratum, stratum basale of the base. So just, you don't need to memorize all these names, by the way, yeah? So I'm helping you on that because it's not needed. But I'm going to a point in so few things. The next layer is the stratum spinosum. The stratum spinosum is going to be here, on the top. Then we have the stratum granulosum. The stratum granulosum is going to be here. Then we have the stratum lucidum. The stratum lucidum here. And then we have the stratus corneo or stratum corneum is this. All this is the stratum corneum. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five layers. You okay with that? Uh, do you, uh, do you, you did facial ones? Okay, when you do facial, what they are doing is to scrub you with some, um, some uh, how you call this, uh, they put coffee or whatever they do, right? In order to, to to exfoliate exfoliation, right? What they are going to do the ex, what is doing the exfoliation? The exfoliation is going to is going to remove the outer layer of the skin. That is the stratus corneum or stratum corneum. Either way, okay. So when you come out from the facial, what people is telling you? What people is telling you? Oh, you look fresh. Right? Look younger. You look younger, right? So why? Because these cells that you have here in the stratus corneum or stratum corneum are dead cells. Are dead cells. Dead cells. So when they scratch these cells, they are going to appear the cells that we have here. That is the stratus lucido. Okay? So and then what happened? Look at this. The stratum lucidum with the time with the time, start in minutes, start to start changing, they're going to go up to this level. So the stratus, the cells of the stratolucidum are going to turn into what is this? It's funny. Okay. So you see here that the, 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 the stratus corneum disappear because of the exfoliation. And what is going to, who is going to take place is going to be the, strat, the other stratum that is the stratum lucidum. So the stratum lucidum becomes the stratus corneum. And the, and the previous one are going to replace the stratum lucidum. So the granulosum is going to turn into lucidum. And the one who is be below is going to turn into what it was in the, uh, what is in the upper layer. And what is in the, the base, the basalis, the basalis is going to turn in, into spinosum, for example, right? So it's going to be like a cycle. They are going to replace the, the layer that is gone are going to be replaced by the layer who is below. Be okay with that? In addition, the stratus basalis, when the basalis is going to pass to the next layer, the stratus basalis, this is going to still producing cells. They're still producing cells. And these cells are going to, again, do the same cycle, replace the one who is in the upper layer. The, the skin is going to exfoliate all the time, naturally. You, you don't have the stratus corneum permanently there. They are going to change. They are going to come out. 
And that is how it's going to be replaced the skin. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yes, yes. Please. Okay, somebody please. Okay. All right. So now, that is one. What happened in elderly person? In the elderly person, person in the elderly and the uh, uh, child, a kid. So what happened is that in the kids, the skin are so soft and so delicate because the, the kids do not have that, that stratus lucidum. The stratus lucidum is not completely developed because it's too young. So it's, not, it's going to get developed when you get an adult life. And what happened with the elderly? Elderly, they don't have the stratus lucidum. No, because they are not being developed, because they are going to lose the stratum lucidum. So in either case, the skin of the baby and the skin of the elderly people are going to be more thinner compared to the adult. Are you okay with that? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. So now, uh, why is important to know about the thickness of the skin? What, what, why is important to know where is more thicker and what, where is more thinner? Do you see these people who want to quit smoking? And they have these patches, these patches, and these patches they put it in some place on the body, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, so um, these patches contain medication. They contain a substance that are going to be absorbed by the skin. They need to be absorbed by the skin. So where do you think you will put, put your, your, uh, your patches? In areas who are very thicker or areas who are very thinner? Thicker. Thicker, why? Mm. If they're thicker, the absorption is not going to be as fast as you have this, the area of the skin that is thin. Make sense or no? Yes. Makes sense. For example, you're, the, you're not going to put a patch of the, or to quit the smoking, nicoderm, whatever it's called, in the palm of your hand, because it's going to have a very poor absorption. You need to, to put the patch in areas where the skin is more thinner. Like for example, the inner portion of the arms or the arms itself, the inner portion of the legs, okay? So those areas are actually where we use for absorption of medication. This medication is not only for uh, nicotine, there are going to be other medications. Like for example, if you go to, uh, to, uh, to a tour to, uh, uh, in, a, in a ship, you have uh, actually those patches, right? When you have, you have a patch that you put in the ear. Those people who are suffering, for example, for motion sickness, motion sickness, this motion uh, sickness are going to use a patch that is uh, antihistaminic. Uh, uh, that are going to put it behind the ear. And that is area where it's going to be absorbed. Okay, we got it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, so is that clear? So in elderly people, please, be careful to when you wash the, the skin. You cannot put, you cannot put, a, a, you, can, you cannot put, for example, uh, alcohol. Why alcohol? Why cannot you? Wh why you cannot put alcohol? You cannot put alcohol because because they are going to first of all uh, they are going to dry the skin even more, and that is going to make it more fragile the the skin of the elderly person. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. In addition to this, uh, you know what is a. Uh, the uh, cortisone, hydrocortisone? Yes. yes. Yeah. Hydrocortisone is for small irritations of the skin, correct? Never use that in elderly person. Why? Because the, this is go, what is going to cause is that uh, they are going to make it even more thinner, the skin of the elderly person. So never put corticoids or hydrocortisone this uh, 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 that you can buy over the counter. So be careful with that. So, so how to clean the, the skin of the, 
of the, of the early, yes, with water and soap. A little bit of soap and water, that is more than enough. Otherwise, you are going to make the skin open, and that is very bad. Be okay with that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in babies, too. The babies, they are using uh, diapers, right? If you put a cream on the diapers and you close the diaper, that is going to make it like a cluster environment, and that is going to make absorb even faster the uh, the cream into the skin of the baby. So the thickness of the skin, how thicker or how thin is the skin, is important. Okay, with that, that is the nursing consideration, and there is many things you're going to apply. So ointments, creams, lotions, etc. And you need to be careful, and you to, you need to know what to, what you're putting on the patient, okay, or where to put it. So the patches are going to be used not only for 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 to prevent uh, to quit uh, smoking, but for pain. People who has, for example, angina, that is chest pain, uh, they are going to use patches on their skin. Tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. What happens if the patient have a lot of hair and you want to put it uh, in some place? What are you going to do? Shave. It's going to shave, right? Okay, yeah. we got it. Yes. Okay. So now, in the skin, in the skin, I want you to you to know this for uh, for. Okay, so I want to remark this. This is a stratus corneum. is composed by dead cells. So all this is epidermis. Look at this epidermis. One layer, second, three, four, five. Five layers. So all these are the five layers only of the epidermis. Okay, don't get confused. It's not, it's not the whole skin. It's the epidermis, and these cells are dead cells contain a protein uh, called the keratin. The keratin. Keratin. This keratin is not permeable for water. It's not permeable for water. Okay, so this no penalty for water means, tell me, when you put water on your skin, your muscles get wet or no? No. No, no right? Because the keratin is no. going to be like a coat, coat uh, coating the, the skin in order to prevent the water get into the, into deeper structures. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so now these cells, these are cells, huh? These are cells. One cell, two cells, three cells. And inside the cells, they are going to have a protein called the keratin. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No. Now, in the epidermis, one of the structures you're going to find is the melanocyte. It's the only one. Because they are, I'm going to ask you, where are the arteries in the skin? Where are the veins? Where are the glands? So. If you remember that the only structure that we will find in the skin is the melanocyte, the rest, what I'm going to ask you, are going to be in the dermis. So at this moment, just remember the epidermis is going to contain the melanocyte. What is the melanocyte? Melanocyte is a cell that contains a pigment that is called the melanin. Melanin. Melanin is a, pig, is a pigment. The uh, people who are uh, dark skin, they contain, they have more melanin than people who have fair skin. You okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Perfect. So that is the epidermis. Then we have here the dermis. In the dermis, we have look at this: blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, nerves ending, sweat glands, oil glands, hair, dermal papilla. We are going to talk about that now. Okay, look at this. So here is the dermis. This is the dermis. The dermis, we are going to have veins in blue. We are going to have arteries in, uh, in red. We are going to have nerves. Nerves are going to be this yellow. Can you see this yellow? Yellow things here? Yes. Okay, so those are nerves. In addition to that, we are going to have glands. We have here, can you see this one? Is the sweat gland. Sweat gland. It's an exocrine gland, as we already know. 
Then we have here another gland that is the sebaceous gland. Look at this. This is the sebaceous gland. Sebaceous gland is going to release oil. The uh, sweat gland are going to se secrete water, basically, and uh, sodium, and some electrolytes. Okay? Look at this. Where is the follicle of the hair? Hair follicle. The hair follicle is in the dermis. The hair follicle is in the dermis. We have a muscle here. Can you see this muscle? This muscle is called the erector pili. And we are going to explain one by one of these. All right, so let's start. Even though the, the hair is going to pass through the epidermis, we know, we you need to know that the, uh, the hair follicle are going to be located in the dermis. Where is the hair follicle? Where is the origin of the, of the hair? In the dermis, no epidermis. We okay with that? Yes. Let's do let's do some experiment. So, which gland is going to be this? This is going to be a sebaceous gland or uh, a gland that secrete oil. I want the concept. So, let's make an experiment. Let's go and I don't want you to wash your hair for one week. What happened with your hair? Oily, I'm so oily, greasy. It's going to be greasy. Why of this? Because of this sebaceous gland. And why is it going to secrete oil? Because this oil is going to keep the moisture of the hair and it's not going to be dry. Okay, now let's do the other experiment. The other experiment is to wash your hair with shampoo every day, two, twice a day, three times a day. What's happening in one week? Your skin will dry it's going to be totally dry, right? Because you are getting rid of this oily substance that is ne needed for to maintain the moisture of the hair. Okay with that? Yes. Okay. Then we have the sweat glands. And talking about the sweat glands, I'm going to probably uh, make a, we are going to talk about the temperature control. Okay, let's go. Uh, let's do another experiment. We are going to be. We are going to Alaska. In Alaska, the temperature is going to be. Let's put it about a uh, five Fahrenheit. Very cold. Okay. Let's go to Palm Springs. You know Palm, Palm Springs? No. Palm, Palm Springs in the South South California, where the temperature is about 110 Fahrenheit. We are in San Francisco, and in San Francisco, the temperature of the environment is going to be right now, let's put it 60, 70 degrees. 70 degrees. Okay? Now, I want you to take the temperature of your body here in San Francisco. Your temperature of your body, let's put it that is 98. 98 Fahrenheit. This is the normal temperature. 97 to 100 is normal. Now, in Al if, you, if you go to Alaska, it's, too, it's too very cold. Your temperature is going to be similar to 98. It's not going to have that variation. Now, for some magic procedures, you're going to go to Palm Springs out of the southern. And instead to have 5 Fahrenheit, you have 110 Fahrenheit. And that is going to take your temperature, and your temperature again is going to be about 98 Fahrenheit. See? So there is something that is happening in the body that is going to help to regulate the temperature. Okay. So now, what happened in Palm Springs? You have 110 degrees Fahrenheit. What happened with your cheeks? They're red. They're red. Right? Yes or no? Yes. yes. If you go to Alaska, how is your skin? Your cheeks are going to be pale. Pale, correct? We got it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so so let's start. If you have here for it, this is the skin. This is the skin. And we have the epidermis. We are not going to draw the epidermis. And then you have here the dermis below. This is the dermis. And the dermis we have vessels here. Vessels. Okay, so I'm going to draw it like this. 
we have a vessel. This is the state of the vessel when you are in San Francisco. When you go to Palm Springs, oh, by the way, and the, uh, in addition, you have the sweat gland here. It's a sweat gland. It's a sweat gland. Here we have a sweat gland. So many, I'm not going to draw many, but just one. A sweat gland. Sweat gland, what is the what is the flavor? <laughs> what is the taste of the of the sweat? These salty. Are your, salty, right? Because they eliminate water and so and sodium, correct? Yes. Correct? Okay, perfect. So now what happened? This is right now, what we are right now. These are our vessels under in the dermis. When you are in Palm Springs, so number one, what you going to happen is the temperature is going to increase how the body is going to try to lose that excess of temperature number one the, the vessels are going to turn vasodilated like this are going to be vasodilate what means vasodilation gets bigger Vaso means vessel vessel means yes vessel means artery or vein okay Vasodilation. Dilation means increase diameter. It's going to increase diameter. Okay? So instead to be a, a, a artery this size, they are going to become like this. We okay with that? Vasodilation. The short word is VSD. So you need to get familiar with that right now because you're going to see that everywhere. Vasodilation. VSD. We okay with that? Yes. Yes. Please, we, we need to finish. Can you please respond? Yes, we have yes, been. Yes, we yes. are responding. Okay. I mean, I've been, I mean, I've been saying the same thing all day. All day. It's just. It's it's there's a delay. There's a delay. Okay. I, know, I know. I'm not blaming you guys. I'm not. I'm not blaming you guys. I'm not blaming you. Okay. So here we have the vasodilation. Correct. Okay. So these vasodilation are going to make the vessel bed get it close to the skin, closer to the skin. And what is running here? Blood. And that's why your cheeks become red. Because there is vasodilation uh, on that area that are going to make the, 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 uh, the vessel increase in diameter and getting closer to the skin. So that's why literally you are seeing the blood running under your skin. You okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. At, yeah. at the same time, at the same time, what is happening? At the same, at the same time, what is happening? You are sweating. sweating. There is a lot of water here. Sweating, right? You are sweating. And what happened with the sweat? The sweating is going to evaporate. Correct? Evaporate. Yes. Evaporate. Yes. Okay. So this evaporation is big. Be, uh, they, this evaporation is going to take the heat from the blood and they are going to dissipate outside of the body with the evaporation. So that's why your temperature of your body is going to keep in 98. For example, if you have kids, you, you know that fever for uh, uh, for kids is very dangerous, correct? Yes. If you have high fever, if you have high, high fever, that if you keep the high fever in the in the in the in the in the kit, they are going to have actually they are going to affect the uh, thermoregulator that is in the hypothalamus and they are going to start having seizures and you don't want to have seizures right you don't have the baby to have seizures why because when you have seizures the, the during the seizures the kid is going to lose consciousness and why they lose consciousness because there is actually the thermoregulator system are going to make the 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 vessels on the on the brain to have less blood supply the more long the longer the seizures you you have on the on the kit they can produce brain damage so be careful with that so what to do what you're going to do is to have to put water on head and the abdomen and what happened when the baby is having high fever so the water starts to evaporate correct the kit is totally red and the water, what it's going to do is to evaporate, taking the heat from the body. 
So that is actually by conduction. So that is going to take the temperature from the body. We okay with that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And why why we have the head and why we have the abdomen? Take the head for the central nervous system, and you need to put it in the abdomen. Why in the abdomen? Because in the abdomen is the the is a, a, a big area where actually the uh, temperature can be dissipated or go out very fast. You okay with that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So now, now that you are sweating and you are actually a, a, a red cheeks, you're going to go immediately to Alaska. If you go to Alaska, what is going to happen? First of all, you're not sweating, right? Minimum sweating. And the vessels that, that are here in San Francisco compared to Alaska, they are going to be like this. So why is doing that? Because the by the by the vessels are going to produce vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction. That is the opposite constriction. That is the opposite of the vasodilation. Vasoconstriction. Vaso means vessel, artery, vein. Constriction means narrowing. So the vessels become vasoconstricted. Constricted. You okay with that? Yeah. And what happened yeah. with this? The the distance from the skin to the to the vessels are going to be deeper. Okay, so and the and the skin start to be pale. Why they go why they do this? Because they want to keep the the, the blood away from the skin that is very cold in order to keep the temperature closer to the to to your body make sense or no yes makes sense okay all right so you already know how we regulate the temperature okay so let's keep moving so let's go going back to the epidermis to the dermis okay so we, we will see these vessels that are going to control the, the temperature, okay? Let's start talking about the erector, erector pili. The erector pili, where is that? Erector, erector pili, can you see here? This is the erector pili. So when you have a cartoon and you so somebody's upset, when somebody's upset, upset, you're going to see you, you drawing the person like that, right? yes or no? <laughs> yes? Yes. Okay. Why is that? So it's anger. I don't know how to put anger. Okay, anger. All right. So why? Because the hair is going to do this, like this, right? You remember the cats or any other animal, when they are actually afraid or they are being attacked, they don't do this, all the hair, the fur and the hair is going to be like this, right? Yes. Do you know Okay, so that is because the erector pili is actually make action. Why the people, why animals are doing this like this? First of all, animals by instinct, what they're, um, humans too, huh? we, humans we have, when you're upset, your hair is kind of like this, right? Yes or no, right? And, and uh, that is one of the, I will say, remnants of uh, our, evolution during thousands and thousands of years and animals are still doing that they have this erector pili making the erection of the of the hair in order them to appear bigger than they are in order to scare the enemy okay that is an instinct that is something that is we are like that okay with that yes, yes. so when you have your your uh, uh, direction of your hair when another situation when, when you you're are cold excellent cold. when you are cold excellent when you are cold right when you are cold what happened with the hair the hair the hair is uh, of the body is what you call goosebumps right yes right? so the hair, the hair instead to be like this they are going to be like that right and this is actually for one reason when the hair is going up when you are cold is because the body is trying to trap packets of air packets of air 
packets of air between the, the hair. And when you do that, looks like the body is trying to insulate the body with air. That's why we have this erection of the of the hair. Will you okay with that? Yes. 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 Is, okay. Okay, so that is the erector pili. Thank you. That is the erector pili. Erector pili. And all right, so what are we going to do? All right, so here we have the nerves. Can you see these nerves? And and nerve. And we have different types, right? Okay, so we have, for example, the Pacini or patient or Pacini, Pacini uh, uh, terminal nerve. Okay, we have the Meissner touch receptor. Okay, so we have different terminal nerves. Nerve for cold, for hot, for a, for a touching, all right, for pain. So we have different type of, this is very important, please. Okay, so listen. So these nerves are all distributed in the skin. Okay, so now I want you to uh, tell me. I don't know. I don't have anything here. Okay, this one. I don't know. Oh, this is a, a an ear plug for. You don't have your for... camera on, Doctor G. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's very. That was very fast. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we was talking about the receptors, right? Okay, so now I would like to uh, have a very uh, small object like this. This is like an earplug for my headphones, okay? All right, and I would like you to close your eyes and grab it like this and try to find out what it is, right? So probably you will get it, right? You will say, oh, this is an earphone, whatever, right? Okay, so probably you, most likely you will do it. Pro most likely, yes. But what happened if I give you that same object and I put it in your back here, in your back, and I'm trying you, you to recognize the structure? Are you going to be able to do it? No, Very no. difficult, right? Okay. That is because the amount of receptors for palpation are going to be different in different parts of the body. Another example, I want you to put your hands like this, and I want you to put cold water. Cold water, put cold water. Okay, cold water, okay, so what? Cold water, cold water, that's it. But now, that cold water, same cold water, I'm going to put it in your back. Is the difference or oh, no? Of course, yes, right? Yes. Right? So what does it mean? The receptors for cold are more concentrated on the back than in your hands. The, the receptors to make palpation, to recognize objects, are more concentrated in your hands than other parts of your body. Make sense? So now, the, the hands is very important when you're going to, uh, when you're going to do your uh, phys uh, physical assessment, palpation on the patient, okay? And even to take the pulse, to take the pulse, to take the pulse. Taking the pulse, it's a, it's a it's very, uh, I mean, very simple technique, but important to know. But when you are doing palpation of the abdomen, palpation of the skin, other parts of the body, you need to use the tip of your fingers. The tip of your fingers. Not like this, of course, but the tip of the fingers, right? The tip of the fingers is where in the tip, in the tip, is in the tip, where you have the higher receptor for pain and for, for uh, touch receptor for touching, to, to recognize objects. So when you are doing palpation, you are not just palp uh, touching the patient because they need to do it. You need to find things. So that's what is the purpose of palpation, to find things. And you need, in, me in medicine, uh, uh, they tell us, when you are doing palpation uh, to try to find a, a lesion, a mass or whatever, you need to feel and you need to think that you have 10, ten eyes on the tip of your finger that you can even so that is how sensitive are going to be the tip of the finger so that's when you're going to take the pulse the pulse you're going you're not going to do like this you're going to do something like that 
trying to put the tip of the fingers on the on the on the pulse. That is who, where how you're going to recognize easily the pulses. Are you okay with that? Yes. Yes. Are you okay with that? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. My God, these return voices. Okay, that's good. Well, anyhow, that's the the thing is I want you to learn. The, the rest doesn't matter. So I want you to learn. That's all what I want. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Uh, what else? What else? Okay, listen. We have. If you have a burn, burn. It's it's painful, right? Yes or no? Yes. It's painful, yeah. right? Why a burn? A burn. What what is going to do is to affect, for example here the superficial area of the skin where the touch uh, what is them. going to affect some receptors so some the heat is going to some receptors so they are going to produce pain dr g you froze uh -huh are going to destroy many of these receptors so this area is without pain but you have a lesion there this is that is the burn is going to go deeper compromising all the dermis there is in the dermis you know that is all the terminal nerves if you destroy the dermis there is no receptor for pain at all there is no sensation and actually You're fading in and out, Dr. G. Hello. We can hear you now. Dr. G, can you go back to the epidermis showing the burns the burns yeah okay the first degree burn the first degree burn basically is going to be the epidermis the second degree burn is going to be the dermis and the third degree there burn third degree burn is going to be down to the subcutaneous tissue okay Hello? Yes, I okay. heard you. That. Yes. So, yes. If you go to, you have a, a sun, sunburn, basically your skin is irritated, it's going to be inflamed, and you have some pain, right? Because some nerves are being affected. Okay, so if, if you have second degree burn, they can have a lot of pain, but in some moments, depends on how many of these nerves are being destroyed, you will have pain but not so much pain but if the lesion go all the way down to the subcutaneous tissue a burn for a fire or something they are going to destroy all these structures it's gone are gone so there is no nerve to feel pain so the third degree pain is painless are you okay with that yeah yes okay all right so what I want you to know here about this is that what do we have the con what is the content of the dermis? Basically, in the dermis we have everything. Do you notice? Everything's in the dermis. So the where is the melanocyte? Somebody can tell me. Dermis. Epidermis. Epidermis. Where is the melanocyte? Epidermis. In the dermis. Where is the melanocyte? Epidermis. Where is it, please? <laughs> Epidermis. Epidermis. It's in the dermis. Where is the melanocyte? Dermis. Epidermis. Where is the melanocyte? Epidermis. 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 
epidermis. Whatever other structure I'm going to ask you is in the dermis. You okay with that? Okay. Yes. All right, so. All right, so the nails are going to be the same story. The nails is part of the integumentary system. The nails are going to have these layers too. We have the uh, uh, stratum bas uh, over be before that. We need to talk about the subcutaneous tissue. The subcutaneous tissue are going to call hypodermis is below the dermis, it's under the dermis. And that is basically contain loose fat, fat. The subcutaneous layer are going to be a, a boundary between the skin and the muscle. So below the fat of the subcutaneous tissue, we have, we have what? The muscle, okay? So basically it's fat. We already talked about the sebaceous glands, oil glands, the sudoriferous glands, the sweat glands. I want to, you to remember the, about the mammary glands. The mammary glands are going to secrete milk, correct? And this milk is actually uh, secreted by the gland. These mammary glands are, are considered a modified sweat gland. Are a modified sweat gland. Are a modified sweat gland. A sweat gland modification. Okay? A sweat gland that is modified. So don't forget that. Okay? It's like a sweat gland, but instead to secrete sweat, it's going to secrete milk. Okay? All right, so let's go over the nails. The nails are going to be here. If you see the nail, we have the nail here, and we have the, this is area is the lunula. Can you see the lunula? Yes. Yes. Okay, the lunula. This lunula is actually about one third of the whole nail. All right, so if somebody loses your nails in the past, you will feel that you say, oh my God, I'm not going to have nail anymore in my life. But the nail is start to grow. Why? Because the stratum basali, that is, you can remove the nail, you can remove the nail, but the stratum basali stay there. And they are going to start producing the nail. Again, little by little, growing little by little the nail. Okay? So they are going to be, uh, this nail are going to be soft at the beginning, but with the presence of oxygen are going to oxidize the, the the surface and make the skin the the nail again harder okay so that is about so functions of the skin we have four four major functions protection against infection because it's a barrier protection against dehydration so i told you the keratin is going to prevent the uh, entry of water when you swimming or something, you're not going to have your in, inside your body is wet, right? It's a very, very, uh, it's like a very luxury swimming suit, right? So you will not get wet at all. They have, uh, and the water cannot go out and the water cannot get in, okay? Only they can regulate through the sweat glands, okay? All right, so regulation of body temperature, we already talked about that, collection of sensory information. Protection against infection is going to have the, the skin that is intact. They are not going to allow bacteria, viruses, other foreign bodies to invade your body. Okay? So that is the first line of defense. It's part of the first line of defense, the skin. Okay? Protection against dehydration, regulation of body temperature, collection sensory information and other activities. For example, we have absorption of substances as medication, like patches, correct? Patches, right? We talk about that. Excretion. Somebody was, was taking medication for more, for several days, and you can tell you are sweating, and you're, you're, when you sweat, the sweat is going to have almost the same smell of the of the medication. Do you, do you experience that before? Yes. Right? Why? Because the skin is a pathway they are going to excrete waste products. It's going to, uh, it's going to uh, a, a pathway where they're going to excrete waste products. The vitamin D is produced by the skin. Vitamin D, 
what is the vitamin D? Vitamin D is a vitamin that promotes the absorption of calcium in the intestine. Vitamin D. The vitamin D is produced by the exposure of the skin to the sunlight. Exposure to the to the to the skin to the sunlight. When you put your skin uh, on the sunlight, your skin is start to produce vitamin D. Vitamin D. But this is not the only source of vitamin D. You can have vitamin D by diet. When you eat your, your vegetables or milk, whatever you, you're taking in your meal, that is going to contain always some levels of vitamin D. So there is two sources, the skin and your diet. We okay with that? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So then we, yeah. we are going to, thank you. We are going to talk about paler, means pale skin. Flushing means red of the of the face. Cyanosis is a blue bluish coloration, discoloration of the, uh, especially uh, nails, lips, ears, and that is what happens when you have low levels of oxygen in your body. You enter in hypoxemia. Hypoxemia. Hypoxemia means hypo. A low amia means in blood, so low levels of oxygen in blood, and that is going to turn you blue. Cyanosis, yellow skin, yellow skin is called jaundice. Jaundice is caused by the presence of high levels of bilirubin. Yellow skin, or called ictericia, you need to know this name ictericia, ictericia, okay, are going to. Uh, be the skin yellow. When, when, where is the first place of yellowish or jaundice you can see? Is in your eye. Endless question. Eye. In the eye, correct? In the eye is where you're going to find f in the first moment the yellow skin. We okay with that? Yep. Okay. I'm not going to mention this uh, deep because uh, actually you will see that in your med search. But macule, what is macule? Macule is a name that we use for, for example, freckles. Freckles. Let's go to the next. We have the vesicle, and we are coming back. The vesicle are elevations. This is the skin. You have an elevation of the skin. This elevation of the skin is going to contain clear fluid. Clear fluid. That is the vesicle. When the vesicle are going to appear like a white head here, like a white spots, so it's a vesicle with white in, uh, content that is called pustum because they contain pus. What is pus? Pus are dead bacteria, dead uh, uh, white cells, uh, destroy red blood cells, destroy normal cells. So that is pus. Okay, so vesicle with uh, white content is pustum, contain pus. The vesicle itself here is going to be a uh, vesicle is going to be a, a, a sac that is going to contain a, a clear fluid. Now let's go back. The papule, the papule is a vesicle, but this this is called papule because the vesicle instead to have fluid, they are going to have a solid material. Could be fat, could be anything. Fat. Okay. When it's solid, the content is called papule. Excoriation is when you are scratching too much. You have itchiness, you scratch, scratch, scratch. That, that lesion is going to produce what we call excoriation. Lacerations is when you cut your skin with some a sharp object. For example, this is typical laceration. Typical laceration. Typical laceration, you will see that there are going to be a very neat border. There are no going, and the knife came from this way, in this way, cutting like this, like that. In this way, like that. Okay, well, anyhow, so I will tell you another time how you know that. Anyhow, so this is the, um, this is laceration. Okay, you okay with that? Another laceration, look at this laceration. Laceration. Yes. Okay. Yes. Ulcer, ulcer is the, we will see the ulcer is, especially when the patient is laying down for a long time, long period of time long period of time in bed, they are going to press the the the, the skin of the of the back of the bottom of the knee uh, 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 um, 
feet are going to be in contact permanently with the bed, making pressure, the pressure of the of the body and the, against the, the bed. And that is going to cut the blood circulation. Cutting the blood circulation, the tissue do not receive oxygen, nutrients, and the tissue start to die and start to produce ulcers. Okay? So be careful with those, those, stu those students, those pa patients who are laying down for a long period of time. Fissure. What is a fissure? Fissure is a, is a crack in the skin. Fissures you can see, for example, in elderly people. They have this kind of uh, a, a bit, right? Or hanging on the body. On the folding, that is going to create a fissure. It's red, it's inflamed, even pain, it starts bleeding. People who are obese, they have a lot of, of tissue that are going to create folds. In the folds, in the in the in the folding is where you're going to have these fissures. We okay with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So first degree, okay, perfect. First degree, first degree is epidermis, second degree is the dermis, third degree is the uh, uh, subcutaneous tissue. Okay. The first degree, when you go to, to the sun, you're going to have a red skin, red skin. In the second degree, it's red skin too. So how we know is, is first degree or second degree? In the red degree, it's just redness. In the second degree, you have redness with the vesicle. You see, or sometimes blister. vesicle appears in the skin. Huh? Or like blistering, right? Yes, like blistering, excellent. Who, who said that? Sarah. Hello? Sarah. Miss Sarah. Oh, Sarah. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Oh, you were participating. I didn't I don't recognize voices yet so far. I'm sorry. But but thank you. And the third degree, the third degree, that is going to be a lesion so deep in the dermis that actually all the terminal nerves are dead, are gone. So it's actually you see black tissue, like a burn, like a charcoal. Okay? All right, that, that is the burns, burns category. So now, I'm going to teach you how to calculate areas of burning. We have the surface of the head is what we call the rule of nine. The rule of nine, of nines, okay? So the head, all the head, all the head, anterior, posterior, all the head, up and down, all the head is 9%. So that means that anteriorly, the head surface is going to be 4.5% of the whole body. And the posterior portion of the head is going to be 4.5% of the whole body. You okay with that? 9%. The head. Now, each arm, one arm is having the same 9%, 9% area. So that means anteriorly, you have 4.5%. 4, 4 and posteriorly, you have another 4.5%. So total, the upper extremity is 9%. So 9%, 9%, 9%. We okay with that? Now, yes. put two arms like this together. And that is going to give you the area of your lower extremities. So one lower extremity is like is the area of the two, of the two upper extremities. So we have 18 and 18. Nine anteriorly and nine posteriorly in each lower extremity. We okay with that? Yeah. And yes. then put put together the two uh, uh, two lower extremities and you have 36. And 36 is the area that is in the thorax, in the abdomen, in the pelvis. So 36 is the whole trunk. Anteriorly is 18% and posteriorly is 18% again. We okay with that? Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, then we have, at the end, we have the perineal area. The perineal area is going to be 1%. You okay with that? Yes. 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 You okay? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to teach you, this is what I was looking for. Tissue repair, how long is it? What time is it? Oh my God, can you give me five minutes, please? <clears throat> sure, okay. Sure. Okay, all right, so we are going to talk about inflammation. Please, this is something that you need to remember for the rest of your life. Inflammation, inflammation, 
Inflammation, when you listen inflammation, please, inflammation means that it's already, already cells are dying. Okay? And inflammation, cells are being destroyed and they are going to be need to re be replaced. And with this, we finish. Inflammation, we have what we call the cardinal signs of inflammation. The cardinal signs of inflammation. Cardinal signs is a Latin, a Latin word, uh, I mean, Italian word. It's not because I, I know Italian, I don't know. Uh, I know some, but, but cardinal is, we use a lot of terminology in, in, in Italian, in French, uh, etc. Cardinal. Cardinal means the most important or the most relevant. Okay, and what are the signs and symptoms of of inflammation? Inflammation, inflammation, inflame, flame, flame, fire, heat. Okay, red. Did somebody red. cut your finger? Did you, did you cut your finger in the past? So yeah. what do you feel? Pain. Pain. Swelling. Number two. Swelling. Red. Swelling. Redness. Red. Red. Heat. What is? Heat. Heat. Excellent. So remember that. When you, when you cut your finger, you feel that? Yes, of course, yes. Everybody is the same, right? Okay. Five. Loss of function. So this is something that you must know always. I'm going to explain that. All right, so lots of functions. For example, you have rheumatoid arthritis. Do you know somebody with rheumatoid arthritis? These rheumatoid arthritis are going to be a person who has pain, swollen the knee, the knee is red, it's heat, right? And, yeah. But at the beginning, there is no loss of function. But what happened after 30 years, after 30 years having the same problem? The patient start to limp, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yes or no? So that means that it's losing the function in the long run. Inflammation process that is going to run for long periods of time, you're going to make lose the function of the organ. For example, we have liver. The liver, you have alcohol. If you take alcohol, you get drunk, and the liver is going to have temporary what we call hepatitis. Hepatitis, hepatitis is not a virus only. Huh? Hepatitis can be if you eat phosphorus or you mushroom that is bad, or something, or you want to, you drink, uh, uh, you you drink what, uh, um, how do you call this, um, Windex, right? You're going to have hepatitis. Okay, anyhow. So this person, when they take alcohol, they're going to have an inflammation of the liver, inflammation, inflammation. So the next day you don't, you stop drinking, okay, inflammation is gone, the liver recover, period, and, until next time. But in, Patients who are alcoholic, alcoholic, they are going to take alcohol every day, every week, every year, for many years. And the liver permanently is going to be inflamed. Inflamed, 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 inflamed. With the time, the patient with alcoholism, the, the, the liver starts to become, is going to shrink. And it's called the cirrhosis. 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 What is cirrhosis? That the liver is going to replace scar tissue. So the, the, the normal tissue of the liver is gone. So it's going to be replaced by a scar tissue. And what happened with the time? With this chronic inflammation, they are going to actually lose, lose the function of the liver. You okay with that? Yes. 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 Okay, guys. That's all for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I, want, I want to I want to thank you everybody for your patience, for your understanding and for your help. This is not an easy an easy thing. It's, it's, it's not an easy when you need to fight against the the internet. Right? It's making it more harder. Right. Right. But, uh, 